From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Uh, Good morning, Mr. Dollar. This is Milo, remember? Oh, Milo Martin, the agent, yeah. Yes, I've just read about that terrible affair about Jarvis Pocket murdered. That was a terrible thing. (sighs) Yeah, he didn't even make it to the hospital. Uh, And you, Mr. Dollar, the killer tried to do away with you, too, huh? All I got was a nice crack on the head and a not-so-nice dunking in the canal. Uh, You were fortunate, Mr. Dollar, extremely fortunate. Yeah, yeah. Anything else you wanted to talk about, Milo? Oh, yes. I'm sorry I wasn't at the office when you called earlier. Well, your secretary gave me part of the information I was after. She remembered a man had phoned your office yesterday. Yes. She said he was a business associate of someone named Joseph Fallon. Well, I was, I was out of the time, but he did leave that message. Well, what I wanted to know is, did he ever call back? No. No, he didn't. He probably will. Unless he figures he's already found his pigeon. Pigeon? What for? Blackmail, Mr. Martin. Blackmail. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Ocean Park, California. To State Unity Life, Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, The Silent Queen Matter. Expense account, final page. 27 years ago, somebody had hired one Joe Fallon to murder Tom Sanford, the husband of silent movie star Mavis Gale. But Joe had muffed the job. Now that somebody had turned killer himself. His first victim, Tom Sanford, who'd been going under the name of Barney Slade and running a penny arcade in Ocean Park. The second, Jarvis Pocket, who could have helped us spot the killer. The only two others who might help us were actor Francis Trevelyan and actor's agent Milo Martin. And both had received phone calls from the killer. The reason? Blackmail, obviously. Item 13, $1.35 cab fare to police headquarters. Morning, Sergeant. Hello, Dollar. How do you feel? Oh, okay, I think. You turn up anything on Pocket's killer? Only this. Two slugs taken from the body, fired from a thirty-eight. From the same gun that killed Barney Slade? The same. Well, it figures. Oh, I wish a lot more did. Hey, look, just what have we got anyway? Maybe you better start with what we haven't got. Well, Barney Slade gets clobbered by a killer who scrawls question marks all over Mavis Gale's photographs in his dingy apartment. To draw attention to Mavis Gale. All right. Mavis is named as a beneficiary in Slade's insurance policy. Claims she doesn't know the man, then takes a look at his body and identifies it as husband Tom, who supposedly was killed 27 years ago on a hunting trip. Right. Then Jarvis Pocket, one of the men who'd been on that trip, fills us in with the info that Mavis Gale's ex-chauffeur had tried to knock off Tom. Yeah, but he goofed the job and got knocked off himself. Question. Had Joe Fallon been hired? Answer? Probably. Question. Who hired him? (laughs) There's a beaut, huh? Say, this Milo Martin ever get in touch with you? Yeah, just before he came over. He got a call, all right, apparently from the same man who called Trevelyan. Mm Mm-hmm. Trying Fallon's name on for size. Oh, he's trying to get a reaction, that's for sure. And when he gets the right one, he'll put on the squeeze. I wonder why he didn't call Mavis Gale and give her the pitch. Maybe he did, and she uh, forgot to tell us about it. Think he called Jarvis Pocket? No, no, I think Pocket would have told us. I wonder if Pocket told us everything last night at Barney's place. Oh, probably not. I think he suspected something or someone. When he left us, he probably did a little prowling of his own. Result, got himself killed. (sighs) Look, it's almost noon. Yeah, yeah. I'll buy you lunch. We'll have about an hour. Then what? Then I'm going to Tom Sanford's funeral. Aren't you? They buried Tom Sanford, alias Barney Slade, that afternoon under cold gray skies that made it look like it would rain any minutes. But that didn't keep the crowd away. All Barney's friends from the pier were there, including Frank Jessup, who ran the mermaid bit, and Twyla James, who pushed pennies at the arcade. Mavis Gale, of course, was there, along with Francis Trevelyan and Milo Martin. 
And there were the usual spectators who came out of curiosity. When it was all over, the sergeant and I started down the hill. Hello there, sergeant. Mr. Dollar. Oh, hiya, Frank. Mr. Jessup. Sure was a nice ceremony, wasn't it? Yeah, very nice. Pier was practically closed down. Everybody here for the funeral. Uh, we're all going to miss old Barney. Somehow I just can't bring myself around to calling him Tom. Don't seem to fit somehow. Sure. Well, I, uh... I got to get back to Twyla. She's taking this kind of hard. Oh, yeah, sure. I was kind of surprised the way Miss Gale stood up. Real brave she was. No tears at all. Yeah, I noticed that. Sergeant? Maybe she was all cried out, Dollar. It happens, you know. Uh Uh-huh. It happens. I went back to my room at the hotel later that afternoon and stretched out on the bed to do a little thinking. Sleep, something I hadn't had much of in the past 24 hours, finally caught up. When I awoke, it was dark outside. After a shower and shave, I wandered on down to the amusement pier again. No particular reason. Then I remembered I still had the key to Barney's apartment. I flicked on the light switch in the living room and sat down. Then as I reached around for an ashtray on the small table close by, my sleeve brushed several medicine bottles to the floor. I was picking them up when somebody came in through the back door. Mr. Dollar? Oh. I happened to notice the light under the arcade door. What are you doing back here? Well, uh, nothing in particular, Twyla. I, uh, I'm afraid I accidentally knocked these off the table. Oh, no harm, I guess. Poor Barney won't be needing them anymore. Well, he had quite an array here. Medicine, pills. Yeah, virus of some kind. Hit him like a ton of bricks a month or so ago. Oh? Did he go to the hospital? <laughs> no, not Barney. He wouldn't hear of it. Well, who took care of him? Oh, Frank Jessup, myself. Between the two of us, we did the cooking and saw to it he got his medicine and all. Well, wait a minute. I thought you said you'd never been in Barney's apartment. Yeah, that's right. First time was when I... I found the body. Well, look, if you and Frank took care of him while he was sick... Well, it was I'd... over at Frank's place in Venice. Oh. Yeah, Barney and Frank and a couple other fellows were playing cards. Suddenly, Barney wasn't feeling so good, so he decided to lie down for a while. That's when the game broke up. Frank stayed with Barney, and when he saw how bad his fever was, he called Doc Ferris. Doc Ferris, huh? Yeah, lives over in Venice. Thanks, sweetheart. Lock up for me. Expense account item 14, $1.50. Cab fare and tip to Doc Ferris's place in Venice... Barney, he told me, had been a pretty sick man, high fever, delirious at times. But Frank Jessup had stayed by his bedside during the crisis and had done a good job of nursing him through the night. Expense account item 15, $1.50, same cab, back to the amusement zone. The attendant at the mermaid bit told me that Frank Jessup had gone home early. Expense account item 16, 75 cents, cab fare to Frank's bungalow in Venice. The place was dark. No answer. You looking for Mr. Jessup? Oh, yes, ma'am. You oh, know, you he know. just left a few minutes ago. Out for a walk, I guess. Oh, that's so? Do uh, you know which way you're headed? Down the street. That way. Good, thanks. I finally caught sight of him a couple of blocks later. He was headed south along a back street. I trailed him all the way out to 47th Avenue. Sand dunes, oil wells, a scattering of houses. Then I saw him duck into some shadows, so I waited. About ten minutes later, a big Cadillac came along, cruising slowly. As it reached the corner, someone inside flicked out a package, and then the car disappeared into the night. Frank Jessup suddenly darted out of the shadows, scooped up the package, and came running straight toward me. Hold it, Frank. What? I said, hold it. Let go. Let, let go. What are you doing here? I don't have to ask you that question, do I, Frank? And I don't have to guess what's in that package. Let go! Not a chance. All right. Look, Dollar. We got a good thing here, maybe. We have. Sure. Sure, why not? 50-50. Is that the deal you offered to your old friend, Barney Slade? Look, look, I, I didn't want to kill him. Only when I went there the other night and told him what I had in mind, he, well, he got sore. Started pushing me around. How did you find out about Barney's past? That time he was sick, delirious, fever make him do a lot of talking? That's right. 
So Barney spilled the whole thing without knowing it. Come on, Dollar, let's get out of here. Pocket guessed you were behind it all, didn't he? Figured that's exactly how you found out, so you had to get rid of him, too. Look, Dollar... Hold still, little pal. Now, who tossed out that package of money? Come on, Jessup! You called somebody on the phone and got a nice, fat reaction when you mentioned the name of Joe Fallon. Now, who is that somebody? I am, Mr. Dollar. Uh Uh-uh. Easy there. I'm a good shot. Well, well. The actor's friend and agent, Milo Martin. Thank you for holding our little friend here, Mr. Dollar. It makes things a lot easier. Huh? Your little friend was running a bluff on you, Martin. I don't think he's got the proof that you hired Joe Fallon 27 years ago. Oh, really? Perhaps not, but I couldn't risk it. Now, could I? So you thought you could make a little time with Mavis Gale if husband Tom was out of the way, that it? Yes, but I was wrong. Didn't even give you a tumble. Too bad, Milo. A stupid woman, really. is quite stupid. And now, little man... Look, Mr. Martin, we can forget all this. Don't be ridiculous. We can't. And by the way, we haven't met, have we? Allow me. Frank Jessup, he runs a stall down at the amusement zone. Mr. Martin, you've got to trust me. I, I can keep my mouth shut. <laughs> I fully intend to make certain of that, Mr. Jessup. Look, all we've got to do is get rid of Dollar here. Oh, you're a sweet kid, aren't you? Nobody will ever know, Mr. Martin, I swear it. You're so right, little man. No one will ever know. Let go, Dollar! Hey! <laughs> Frank pulled away from me somehow and started racing across the sand dunes, but he didn't get very far. Milo Martin pumped two shots into his back. That meant he took his eyes off me for just a split second, and that's all I needed. What? I belted him where he was very, very soft, and then followed with a hard uppercut. Milo, 10% Martin, folded without a sound. 17th and final item on expense account, $185.10, hotel and incidentals in Ocean Park and transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total, $436.25. End of accounts. Remarks about Frank Jessup. He got his out there in the sand dunes for the murders of Tom Sanford, alias Barney Slade, and Jarvis Pocket. About Milo Martin, in jail, awaiting trial for murder of the above-mentioned F. Jessup. About Mavis Gale. She's going to see to it that the good work at Brother Pocket's rescue mission goes on. We'll donate $25,000 to the cause. (laughs) Yeah, you guessed it. That'll be the insurance money. End of remarks and a report. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star with a special announcement. Yes. I think you'll be glad to know that beginning Sunday, instead of five times a week, we'll be on the air only once a week, but with a complete half-hour story. Remember, that's beginning this coming Sunday. So join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. This week's story was written by Adrian John Doe. Heard in the cast were Paula Winslow, Virginia Gregg, Victor Perrin, Paul Dubov, Frank Gerstel, John Daner, Lawrence Dobkin, and Chet Stratton. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Remember, we'll now be on the air on Sunday nights. The time will be listed in your newspaper with more exciting stories of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs> <laughs>